All right, welcome to part two of what? What even is this show? Social distillation, where where I need a drink because it's it's wheel of time time. Yeah, and I've been chomping at the bits to talk about these these couple episodes for some time. So uh, I've got notes through episode four. I don't know where you are. No, yeah, and two and three kind of blur together to me. It's kind of like one long episode. Um, so I I was ready to rant about two and three. Episode four, I was just bored. To me, that was one of that. That was perhaps the greatest sin of episode four. So I was just bored. I just, See, I didn't. I care actually anymore. liked episode four. But I had, yeah, I had some thoughts about it as I was watching. But let's, where do, where do you want to start? Um, well, we open up with uh, Celine, who, to me, that opening scene, I, I was like, oh god, they made her a whore. But it turns out she's the innkeeper. They just mm-hmm. have her talking about charging him for sex in the very opening scene as the innkeeper. So I guess innkeepers are whores. So so there was that. But she's actually, I like her as, as, a, as an actress. Uh, and he's kind of playing off of her, so it's okay. Uh, but then we get to Perrin right away. And uh, I hate the way they're doing his visions. Mm-hmm. They were trying to combine the fly scene with Perrin's mm-hmm. dream visions, and it's not working for me. It, the, the way they're doing vi- visions in general is not working for me. Now, I, I can't say I have a better cinematography, uh, cin- cinematic way to do it, but at the same time, it's just it's not working, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, that scene was annoying i w- i wasn't sure what they were trying to do there except they're trying to well th- that that is something that uh... well, they were using a scene from the books to yes. try to incorporate everything back together which you know we get the the merge all dead we get you know the the implication that Payton Fain did it we get the whole something is wrong with the veil between the real world and something else at mm-hmm. this point, which they never, they haven't done enough to establish what that something else is. But this was a thought I, I had because there's, there's a lot more parent in episode four and it got me to thinking, I'm, I'm curious how people who haven't read the book are reading these scenes. Cause there are a bunch of things we're inferring from these scenes, but that's because we know all the backstory that they haven't bothered to tell us here. So I'm curious how these scenes play for someone who has, you know, no no understanding of what Perrin is and how the Wolf Brotherness works and everything like that. Well, we we've we've made this comment a lot, and now you tell me if it's just like a oh okay, uh, that the, the 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 these films weren't made for the fans. Well, how about we make the comment they're actually not made for anybody. So they're willing to throw in something from the books with no context to kind of get the fans on the, the, the book fans on board without even any care that it's going to throw people who have never read the books off. That's a good point because, and this was again, something I was thinking about and, and, and trying to come up with a uh, kind of, coherent theory for why this is but but i've i've complained before about modern sensibilities make modern writing suck and and one of the hallmarks of modern writing is you don't have a coherent story what you have are a group of scenes that are supposed to elicit a particular emotion so before we get to the the parent scene here in episode two we have a, a short scene with Ma Rain and Lan recovering um, from from the healing from the the Madral attack, and it just it just made me think that so much of those Ma Rain and Lan scenes, and even even on after Ma Rain leaves and, and Lan with Alana and her warders, they don't feel like they make sense. They don't feel like there's any connection there. It's just Oh, now it's a scene with these people. Oh, now it's a scene with these people. And it's what what's the through line? What's the connection there? Well, and I think this is on purpose, which makes me sad 
because I think they're really trying to put at least the air that there isn't the connection that the actual book Small Rain and Land have. There was this, this transactional relationship from the beginning. And I, I, what makes me even more sad is I think they're trying to give that air so they could surprise us later. But like, oh, they were all in on everything from the beginning wow. and all this animosity between the two of them. That was just to throw you off. And well, there's a there's a thought. My thinking was going somewhere else because. Was this one? I don't remember if we were still recording or not when we, when we mentioned this last time that I, 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 I said that. Maureen being cut off, however, she's cut off. I don't understand the point. I don't know why they felt the need to to do that. And you made the point of of it maybe that they're combining Moiraine's story in the early books with Sawan after she gets mm -hmm. uh, cut off, and, and combining those stories. And and it it just dawned on me that something another thing they might be doing here with the way Moiraine is acting isn't she acting a lot like how Rand acts in the great hunt in the book when he's trying to push everyone away? Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's a very good parallel as well. Yeah. And if, and, and she's because remember it, now she's supposed to be the main character of the shows. Yeah, yeah. She's the main character. She's the driving force of the action here. So no, yeah, sure. That makes sense to me that they would, they would, they would steal from the actual main character and put that on Moraine as something as something that that she is now doing too that this is her thing to to protect people to do the right thing to greater good blah blah whatever mm -hmm. where in the books she was a bitch a lot but she always was clear about what she intended with everything where yes. now she's just being a bitch in general yeah and for for no real point that i can see except to drive well, people except drive to drive land, land to Nynaeve that's one of it one part instead of land wanting to be with Nynaeve there's yes there's two, yeah. two things there to uh I think they're trying to add a bitterness element with her not being able to touch the power instead of a longing element which is what we got from Sawan in the books uh maybe they're just they're just really missing they're swinging and missing on having her have purpose like Swan did mm -hmm. in the books because that was the whole thing is she did kind of act like a, a, a little mini bitch tyrant sometimes but she was trying to keep herself alive mm -hmm. and maybe they're going for that here but it's just I, like I said a swing and a miss it's it's uh I don't think they have the talent to write that no no they do not uh all right where, where's your next note uh, there were a couple things that I, I just, I guess I lost all faith in the people writing this because I started throwing assumptions in, out there and writing notes. And then it was like, oh no, this is just some random person that they introduced in there. Like I thought this guy, Errol in the sanctuary, mm -hmm. not sanctuary, the sanitarium was going to be Herod fell with the way he was talking in the beginning. And then I, I, I hit pause on Amazon and you can see who the character is. Yes. And it was Errol. I'm like, who's Errol? But apparently he was a former blade master teaching Lan how to be a blade master because we couldn't have Lan do that at Valdara because they made Rand pretend he died and leave. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're they're trying to just this to me was a patch for a mistake they already made. They're like, oh, he's bleeding. Put a Band-Aid on it. Yep. Well, and they ruined it because... So initially, my first thoughts were, uh, this is dumb, but okay, at least, all right, you know, in a way. This this works. Oh, did I? Oh, no, we haven't. This is this was off air last time. So okay, you keep talking. It works okay. for my theory on Logan. So my initial thought was, okay, well, this is dumb, but he, he's got to earn a living. He's got to make his way somehow because he's off on his own. He's trying to stay away from from the people he he knows and loves and and there there's an element here reminiscent of of play for your supper that that sequence of of events in eye of the world where they're where him and matt are trying to get to camelin mm -hmm. and and he's he's playing the flute so there's an element of that of him having to work to make his way and you 
and you're you're highlighting that he is a good and decent person because he's working in a sanitarium to help you know people in need people who can't help themselves and you finally did something that we were griping about the whole first season is they they couldn't bother to take 15 seconds to show land training the boys mm -hmm. to show him being the mentor to the boys but at least you threw a little bit in here now but then later i feel like they they don't completely ruin it but they at least mostly ruin it when you see that oh he's not in there just to help the people he's in there because Logan's in there and he wants to talk to Logan. Yeah. But that, that plays into my theory about what they're doing with Logan right now. And uh, it surprised you last time. So we'll get, we'll get to that one when we get there. Cause they, they go away from this scene now. Mm -hmm. so, so then my, my next note was on a lane. So do you, ha did you have anything else before that? Um, no, after that, we no. get the intro to a lane and this is, yes. this is where I started writing in all caps uh because this became a theme for the next two episodes lazy 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 we couldn't make her look queenly in any other way but to have a bunch of servants moving her into the white tower with all this fluff and flair and like like mm -hmm. the books didn't even exist that you when you're a novice you're a novice mm -hmm. you're you're this goes along with your point from last time of isn't it weird that all of these novices are being able to talk back to the eyes that i with no yep. repercussions well, this is, this. it's just, it, again, the the word is lazy. I can't even think of a better word for it, it. It is completely contrived because they wanted, how do we, how do we set her up to show that she's a princess, to show that she's important? And then to, to immediately have that, um, that, that awkward contrast between the princess and the innkeeper's daughter with a, with a Gwen. Mm -hmm. Um, but then later it's a double contrivance because they, they want this silly scene to show that she's a princess and to have that weird moment with her and a Gwen, but they overcome that to become friends. But then later you get to see Elaine's character because apparently this was all done by somebody else. And, and, and so, but she doesn't want to say who it was. So she's going to accept the punishment for them. So, okay, great. You, that again, that's back to, there's no connection here. It's all just scenes because that scene or those scenes taken in a vacuum are actually good. The, her her initial interaction, Elaine and Egwene's initial interaction, is is really good in a vacuum. And even you know, looking at the books and their initial meet and their initial reactions to each other, and then later you that that is a major component of Elaine's character that she would do that. She would take the punishment for someone else because they don't deserve it. And and I, ultimately, I'm the one in charge, so I'll take the punishment. But it all falls flat because it all comes from a contrivance. So there's there's no through line, there's no setup, mm -hmm. so there's no payoff. It's just a moment. Well, and it almost seemed to me they were trying to interject like a light moment. Like this is it yes. was a very it was very Harry Potterish, you know. It was it was it, to me childish. Well, and even before we get there, there was another contrivance that annoyed the crap out of me, which is when Leandrin is trying to, for lack of a better word, seduce Nynaeve, and she takes her to the healing house. Why is that an accepted healing instead of an actual yellow? Mm -hmm. how, how hard would it be to have it be an actual yellow sister? And she gives a little lecture to Nynaeve. We've already been told that healing is very complicated and very dangerous. They've mm -hmm. act, they've set that up in the series. This isn't just coming from the books. So, and it would have it would have been another moment to establish the authority of the Aes Sedai. But no, you have it as a why? Why is that an accepted? It makes no sense. It's not necessary. I, I think because they don't want to establish that Nynaeve is special. Or they can't they can't write the establishment that Nynaeve is special even though she's going to be an accepted. So they have to have accepted do these things. So that way it's a normal way of mm. it happening. So now in the next few episodes, when Nynaeve is doing something, you accept the fact that accepted do this. Or again, band-aids. Who was the leader of the battle at Faldara? The former accepted. Mm. who knew how to link who knew how to do all of these things was blowing up trollocks and ultimately was overdrawing the power that's a good point so yeah you, you it, it's a band-aid they're they're making the accepted something more than they are because they've already done so much 
and they don't know how to make Nynaeve special without having her already able to do these things once she's in accepted. Except to except to have Leandrin and some of the others continually tell us how powerful and how much potential Nynaeve has, but they're not showing it to us. Except, you know, they kind of showed it to us in that scene in season one where she she lashed out at, at Logan and healed everybody. And- yeah, I was just going to bring that up because they've already ruined it all because the moment she broke her block has already happened. But now that she's got a block again. Mm-hmm. And so wh- what are you going to do to break the block again? Because you can't have night. You can't have land dying again. You've already done that. Mm hmm. It's going to be Egwene, I think. Egwene is going to have something very bad happening to her. It's probably going to be with the Shanjin here. She frees Egwene from the Shanjin with a sudden breaking of her block. There's my prediction. Hmm. Well, we'll see. Yeah. All right, so where's your next? Oh, uh, the, the the other thought I had about Elaine, and I, I kind of feel bad saying this because, again, uh, acting is hard. I've done it. In, um, I've, I've done mediocre acting myself, and I know how hard it is just to do mediocre acting, but Elaine has a great voice. She has a lot of inflection, a lot of emotion in her voice. I love her line delivery, but her face almost never changes. Well, it's, it's I, you really... said she was attractive, but I'm going to, uh, sorry, I hate to do this. Uh, open image in new tab. I, I like her this, look this is, for Elaine. This is but... what it reminded me of. All right, that's going too far. The way no, her I, mouth is, and just, I was just like, uh, supposed to be one of the three hot girls that Rand is like madly she, in love with. Exactly, she's she's a trope. She is the princess, and the way she's described when you first meet her is literally breathtaking. So, Besides the fact that yes. he just fell and bumped his head, Rand can't think of anything to say. He can't talk. His mouth is drying. His brain is going dead because so, she's so stunning. She triggers the the moron chemicals in his brain so this piggybacks on what you were saying because when you talk about actress selection you you want the best person for the job so you would give up a little bit of looks if she was an amazing actress Mm -hmm. but she's not able to pull off the facial expressions and stuff like you said a mediocre actor on some some stage plays this is amazon prime video Mm -hmm. you have your selection of people you can either find someone who can act or you can find someone who looks the part. You have enough resources. You can probably find both, but we didn't get either in my view. I I, I actually think her biggest problem and what's annoying is, so if you pause, you know, you see, you see the, the actor's headshot. Uh, if you pause on, on, on prime and you can, you know, uh, click on them to see what else they've done, whatever. This is something I noticed and I commented on in season one, because when I when I was looking, uh, who is this person? Do I know this person with Alana? Alana is supposed to be stunning as well. She's supposed to she she's not just in looks, but then she's also got that Domini alluring personality to her. And she looks good in red carpet pictures and other pictures. She does not look nearly as good in the show. Well, same thing here with Elaine. If you look at her headshot. She's much more attractive than in the show. Uh, I don't know what they're doing to make. I think Nynaeve is the only one that looks as good. They might be trying to make her look younger there because the actress is going to be in her 20s. But Elaine is supposed to be like 17 here. She she that that was. That was both me and the wife's comment is no, she looks she looks good, but she doesn't look stunning. She looks cute because she looks like she's still got some baby fat on her face. She looks very young. Um, but it, at least, <laughs> at least they never. She never does anything offensive. There are some contrivances, but they use her very well. But I think that's probably also because they use her very sparingly, as as a uh, as kind of a narrator something that's been sorely missing in the series so far is that um the 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 characters come from the back end of nowhere 
for a reason. One of it is because it defines their personalities, as we see at the ver from the very beginning with the Eye of the World, but also because then they don't know anything. So people have to keep explaining things to them. So we, the reader, have things explained to Well, yeah, to and us. it explains all their their F-ups along the way, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So so they, well, they but it also has you some... actually use a lane for that, which is good. But it also has... it. The, the fact that they don't know anything makes for good moments in the books, which they tried to capture one here coming up with Rand burning the letters. But in the show, Rand burning the letter looked like he was doing it on purpose, where in the books, he just didn't know better. He was like, I am not a lord. I am not going to any of this. I'm gonna, And he just did it. Mm hmm. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking in this note. I said, Varen is okay. I need to see more. But I think they took away the mystery. So what was that scene right after Alana? Or, or right after Elaine, I mean. Something with Varen. Was it another Maureen talk with her? Um. Well, you had a, you had an annoying Alana scene. Um. Well, that, that comes up. Here. Oh, it's uh all right. So the next, yeah, the Varen scene is when they're making camp and looking looking out in the distance, they can see the white tower. And Varen, this is this is basically the Varen scene when Varen goes in to talk to Moraine and Sawan in the book, but just just with Moraine, where basically Varen tells her, Yeah, the dragons were born. I'm I I'm not a dummy. I know the signs. I know the mm. prophecies. I'm I'm a brown. I'm a smart lady. So I I know what's going on here, and I'll help you. Uh, is it, basically that scene. I don't know what ruined it for you though. Yeah, I have to watch this one again. Uh, the next scene is got a WTF from me. Uh, this one I may have missed something, but I don't think I did. So I'm gonna have to rewatch it. Rand killing that dude. Yeah, and and I'm pretty sure that at the very end of that scene, he you hear him groan and see him move slightly. Uh, but and, even and they, still attacking him, yes, in cold blood, intending to kill him. He there is there is a moment there where I think what is what is supposed to be happening here is that, um, the the madness the 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 allure of the dark is tempting him if and that's he just the case barely at the last moment pulls back if they if that's the case they did not do a good job because basically what you have is a guy who kind of pisses him off at work and he goes and stalks him and takes him down and very nearly kills him at the very minimum yes. at, at the minimum they could have used the, the the cheap special effects and had a little taint come around him or something yep they they yeah. could have done it if 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 you're talking about as the taint and madness you could have done like they did with Logan in that that episode three of the first uh se season where somebody there's something talking in his ear yes you could have done that 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 would have been acceptable because we're getting to that point in the books where th there is a little bit of that going on and and it wouldn't even have to be an actual voice yet it could just be the yeah that you yeah. hear sometimes that's that's all it would have taken to to really drive that point and instead what you have here is like i said initially i kind of liked the sanitarium angle and then now you go and ruin it and once again i have to say do you guys even know that this is supposed to be the hero of the story because you yeah, sure you, aren't act treating you got a like guy one. who's slowly maddening or you've got a thug and what they've portrayed there was a thug mm -hmm. yeah and and it I was kind of half expecting, but but knew they wouldn't do this, that, OK, what's going to happen here is he's going to rough the guy up and threaten him of you. You harass this guy anymore and I'll really hurt you mm -hmm. is what I was kind of. It, it is what my immediate expectation was just just because that that's the the obvious next step for what it seemed like they were trying to set up. But if, but then uh, the. Then I said to myself, yeah, they're not going to do that. They're going to do something dumber. But you know what? You could have fixed this with making the other guy even more idiotic by just having Rand out with Celine later. And the guy comes up and starts being a jerk again to Rand mm -hmm. directly. And Durant, Rand stands up to defend Celine. Mm -hmm. You could have done it that way. 
it, it also would have would have fed into what they're trying to do with her more because if she she could have you know planted that little seed in his ear that made him go overboard which is mm -hmm. what she wants you know ultimately if if well and again this goes back to the i don't know how this plays for someone who hasn't read the books because knowing who celine is i can see what she's doing i don't know if it's playing that way for anyone who hasn't read the books yet because yeah. because what you see what you see in episode four i don't know if that's enough to establish who she is and what she's trying to do yeah we'll we'll get to that because i thought it was but uh Let's see. And so he beats the ever living crap out of that guy, and then he goes and he bangs Celine. Yeah, and then we got and, we got the scene with Leandrin with her dad, or no brother, or son, her son. son. Yeah, son. yeah, yeah. Turns and out later, it, it, I think it, that's in episode four. And so this that. this yeah. one is is speculation uh, because if they're combining Leandrin with Elida, are we going to get dark friend Leandrin, or are we going to get just bad person Elida? And they're trying to make her more human here, which could add motive to things later, but I don't think that was necessary. I, I wasn't quite sure what the point of that was, except... I think the point of it is that it's part of her getting close to Nynaeve. I think that, that yeah, were they just trying to humanize her and mm -hmm. give her, again, another contrivance to get her closer to Nynaeve. But then, but then they ruin it because, again, there's no connection. It's only separate scenes. So... We, we we talked last time about they, they seem to be, to, uh, to your point about com combining Leandrin and Elida's character, is they've lifted a lot of what happens in New Spring between Moraine and Sawan and Elida, and and they're doing that with Leandrin and Nynaeve. And so, but, but because they're not good storytellers, they're not telling a story here. So Leandrin loses it when Nynaeve finds finds out what she's doing and and basically said you know basically says what Elida says which is at the time which is you know I was trying to help you but now we're enemies now I despise you but then she goes back to trying to help her mm -hmm. like, well, well okay then what was your point there again there's no connective tissue there's just scenes that are supposed to elicit emotion I had a thought here I forgot what it was about Landrin um, or the next. Oh, oh no! Be before we leave, um, uh, uh, before we leave Rand here, apparently Celine likes it rough. Which you know, I'm actually, I can see that mm -hmm. because again, that's part of what she's trying to do. She's trying to pull out this this part of Rand's character. Again, it would have so much more impact if if they had a little cognizance of this world is not our world, this isn't the world you live in writers of this show. So he yeah, banging you... a Gwen in the first season, to me, it takes away from this because if, if this is a young man and he has a mature first lover, that's going to create a much stronger emotional bond. And it's going to make it much easier for her to manipulate him. Mm -hmm. There's so much less impact here because this is just this is just business as usual, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he was until she came out as a dark friend. He was going to bang the innkeeper from the the what the fourth episode or whatever. It it it's just like no, it's they're just banging. Everybody's banging everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, then we uh, get to right. Matt and Min. And at first, yes. my first thought, and it didn't take for very long because we never even got out of this scene. My first thought was, okay, this could be a good way to get Matt back into it. A Matt-Min pairing, even though it mm -hmm. never, ever happens in the books. Not not through the entire 14 books are Matt and Min ever together as a team. Mm -hmm. Or even in the same place at the same time, except in Barrowland in the very beginning. Because mm -hmm. by the time Min gets to Rand, Matt's already off doing the things we're talking about in Winter's Heart. So... Yes, completely inaccurate, but I could see it being a good pairing if they did it right, and then they did it wrong. First of all, Min is too much. This is okay. This is what I brought up the last time we were off air. What I was uh, talking about, Min as a boyish girl, a tomboy. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's that's the books. Mm -hmm. 
but they tried to make her, and I'm not saying this because she's Asian. She's like Rufio from Hook. She's one of the lost boys. She's Rufio, and she's this show off kind of uh, rumble in the Bronx, Jackie Chan movie gangster that is very there, overly cartoony to be reason, her boyishness. The reason men work so well and is a fan favorite is because she isn't over the top. She's not a caricature. So what they're doing, because they don't know how to have str- how to have actual strong female characters, they just know how to make the caricatures of them, is they have in or in order to and to guys try our and age, we already had it. <laughs> we we had the tomboy girl that mm-hmm. is, you know, a fan favorite and makes sense as the semi love interest as a main character. Yeah, they're much younger in that movie, but at the same time, you just project that to someone who grew right. a few breasts and has a butt now. You know, Be- and. Because they don't know what a actual... couple breasts. You don't want them to have a few breasts. That's from that... Total Recall, I think. Yeah, that's a totally different movie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the three breasted chick prostitute was Total Recall. Anyway, um, because they don't know how to write actual strength, they have to go overboard. So she's no longer a tomboy; she's a butch dyke lesbian. Mm-hmm. Which makes me wonder if they're even going to do the love interest with Rand. Oh, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, and I, I'm actually wondering if she's going to be a combination, the boyish girl, and she's going to be a two-on combo with Matt now that they've brought them together. I can see something that dumb happening, given how dumb everything else is. But then the worst um, part of that whole scene was the vision. Again, they're doing visions poorly, Hers were a little better than what they're doing with Perrin, but then him stabbing Rand. Well, we know everything Min sees is true. Mm -hmm. So is it metaphor? Is he going to like accidentally do something that hinders Rand in some way? Or is he actually going to legitimately stab him? Or is it something stupid? Like that's the golem pretending to be Rand. And Matt's the one that kills the golem, right? That's a good point. There, there, there's so many stupid things that can come out of it. And there's so many things that can come out of it. And none of them are good. Okay. I was, uh, I was pulling up uh, episode seven of season one because I did not remember her looking so butch before. And she does still have the same haircut, but they, they had it pulled up. So it didn't look like a mohawk. Um, actually, no, it's not as shaved. So it is cut close like here, but it's not like she has like a full on mohawk now with the sides of her heads completely shaved. She wasn't, she wasn't like that in the first season. So she's still a little more butch than tomboy, but you can, she still looks feminine here in the first season. I wonder if this is again, modern audiences, if this is a little bit of creep. Uh, concept creep not creep like a creeper creep concept Mm -hmm. creep because our definition of what is boyish now for girls is so much further than it was back when Mm -hmm. my girl was made it's a good point where she just wore blue jeans and wanted to play in the dirt you know now it's got to be this kind of like you put a butch dyke shaved head uh, mannerisms of a boy everything she, I think she even has a deeper voice than Matt in this scene. Uh, the only the only thing I liked about this is that these were some of the f- few moments where the characters seemed like they were actually the characters they're supposed to be. And, and because you had actual character moments here. But they were very few and far between. And then we jump to back to Rand and Selene after their rough sex and they're laying there. And I actually like this scene because w- when you know who Celine is, mm-hmm. the, the line at the end of it kind of hits a little bit more home where she says, you help me remember and I help you forget. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's uh, you know what that means uh, if you've read the books. But 
it's also a good setup if you've never read them. So that's a scene that works for everybody. Unlike what we talked about earlier with the flies, which actually takes away from everybody. All right. And then we get some more Moraine land nonsense. And then we get that ends with the, uh, <clears throat> well, actually it, there, there is one scene. So then it, after the Moraine land nonsense where she says, go with Alana or I'll compel you to, um, which was dumb and annoying on multiple levels. Did you have any thoughts on that or should we just move on? My, my thought on that was, ah, uh... ah, uh, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and then we get the Shinarans um, attacking this little village, or, or the the Sanchin attacking this little village where the Shinarans are staying. Yeah, and, and this one, this one, part of it that bothered me was th remember our complaint about uh, the first season where you have no real concept of distance, and our complaint about the Witcher too. You have no concept of distance between these places. They're all of a sudden in Toman Head. That's a long way. In fact, one of the other characters makes a comment about how far it is later in another it, it, one of these episodes. I think it's Nynaeve makes the comment. It's a long way there. It'll take several months to get there. Well, we didn't get that passage of time. Not We didn't even get a three months later like we did in the first season. Yeah, that's we a good point. We just got there in Tome and Head. There, there, are, there are a couple of times where, where I think a Gawain makes a comment about gives you a sense that time has passed because she references last year. I think she says last year a few times to let you know that she's been in the tower for a while. What happened at the end of season one was a, was a little while ago. Um, but you don't get much of a, and this is, this is critical drinkers, big gripe about the, everything looking like cosmopolitan Los Angeles uh, is uh, you know, or in this case, where a lot of the casting was done, cosmopolitan London. There's no sense that these people are from this place and those people are from that place because you have this everywhere you go, even this tiny little village in the middle of nowhere. You you have a pretty wide range of of look and dress, so you have no sense of where anything is in in the world. Um. What, which again is annoying because you can still have your diversity casting. Just make make it so that okay, instead of instead of kind of a, a an Iberian Spanish look, the people from Tyr, it looks like the subcontinent and it looks like India. That's that's where these people come from. Okay, fine. I you know I've even heard people talk about that the way the Domini dress and act uh, that. In, in in some people's mind on the forums, there were people who thought of Eridoman as um as Indian. And then the way the sea folk are described, other people say, No, I see the this, that's what I see. These people anyway, the point being, you could have more diversity than just what I think it's supposed to be, which is uh Europe and some of the Mediterranean is is the cultures of Randland. But then stick with it so that that's how the people here look. That's how the people there dress. Here's the diversity in the Miss Poland pageant. I yes, regions do matter. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no sense of scale. There's no sense of geography. There's no sense of separate cultures is another thing that that gives you is that people from different places look and dress and act differently because there are different cultures. Everything just looks the same. So, so it, it's a very bland palette. So it, that contributes to, again, the, as, as I've referenced before, you might not notice, but your brain did. Well, That's let's go ahead and close that. out episode two, because I've got something at the beginning of the next episode that plays right into that. The, the only thing I liked about this scene really is that loyal gets a moment to be cool. And the, and the the framing of it reminded me of the uh, uh, of the the early fight scene in Thirteenth Warrior, which is one of my favorite movies. Yeah, um, and it, it was very much like the fight scenes in uh, Last Kingdom too, which makes sense because some of the actors were the same actors. So it was yeah. uh, 
and and the ca uh, the the cast director is the same person so it it was very re reminiscent of that so if you like that style you get that from that other show as well so so but then to your point so where i wanted to finish up on this is when when you get the scene with the the giant uh platform being being brought in that's very reminiscent of you know clearly stolen from 300 um wait a minute even if you don't know the books even if you don't know who suroth is this is clearly someone very important and she's attacking a tiny fishing village on the side of a lake with maybe 50 people mm -hmm. what the hell this makes no sense you don't have to know the books to go what the heck is going on here and, and how Honestly, how hard would it have been to put in some CG army in the background behind her to just give you the sense that, OK, this wasn't just 50 people attacking this tiny village. This is a whole army marching through and assimilating everything they they roll over. Anyway, um, but then the the actual end of the episode is when. Rand goes in and you see, okay, so the whole point of this was to get in to see Logan. And did you have any thoughts on that or did you just want to move on to what's uh, next? I have a thought on that, but that was in the middle of the next one where it kind of became more obvious, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll move on to episode three. Which, which starts with Nynaeve and the arches and the mm -hmm. test. All right, we're starting episode three and we're starting at the rings with Nynaeve. And one thing I thought they did okay in that scene in front of the rings is the idea that Nynaeve is slightly a reluctant hero. They kind of pulled that off a little bit. Yes. Anything uh, on that scene before we go inside the ring? Because then I go into my rant about diversity. No, I was just, oh, hey, look, uh, Nynaeve has a father. Who knew? <laughs> well, okay. So we're going to get to the big rants. This, this, this scene was, uh, yeah, it was special. It was special. Uh, but yes, yeah, she does have a father, but notice her father was kind of the, he had, he had the feminine role in the family and the mother had the masculine role. <laughs> but before all that, we get her in the high grass with her fro, her Angela Davis fro going in the, in the wind and the first thought i had was one of the shows i like was lucifer and one thing they did in that show a lot was they inserted scenes to showcase the talent of the actors and actresses that were playing them like tom ellis doing kind of a broadway piano you know rendition of something or it, just every character having a moment where they can showcase that they're actually talented and not just some person that has a script, right? They can, they can sing, they can dance, they can do all of these things. And they would, they would interject these things kind of in comedic moments usually, but it, it was, it was something that, that was a part of the show and I liked it. And it gave you a depth to the, the actors and actresses actually playing these characters in wheel of time. What we keep go, go getting is showcases of ethnicity. <laughs> Let's show her curly, her curly flocks in the wind, her her fro going in the wind. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I I just had a hunch, and so just a quick internet search away. This is the naive the Zoe Robbins we get for Wheel uh -huh. of Time. This is the Zoe Robbins we got in that episode for mm -hmm. Wheel of Time. Pre Wheel of Time, Zoe Robbins. It's a little bit different, just just a wee bit, and uh, yep. it reminded me of pre twenty fourteen Colin Kaepernick mm -hmm. versus twenty fourteen Colin Kaepernick. It's like look how ethnic we are when this is not ethnicity braids and all of this. It's it it doesn't change who you are to do all these things. In fact, you're giving me a caricature and that's racist. Mm. You're, 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 you're embracing the magic Negro. 
Yeah, exactly. We're, we're talking, it, the, the minstrel show you're, the, it is now suddenly known. I mean, I, I, are we going to end up going back full circle to where the birth of a nation is no longer a, a racist, problematic stain on our history? <laughs> But then add to that something you were talking about earlier. One of the reasons Alana isn't as stunning as she is in real life is because mm -hmm. they're playing that angle. They're trying to make her as tropishly Indian as possible. Yes, that was. Yeah, I, I don't think you said that when we were recording, but that's a good point because they they're they're not interested in the fact that she is a, uh, a, a beautiful woman and a capable actress. They're interested in the fact that she's Indian, that mm -hmm. she is of indian ethnicity and they really drill in and play up on that in ways that that are like a minstrel show um especially in these these episodes well, not episode, only that she's a progressive indian that's or is she pakistani that would even make a bigger statement that's, that's a good point we, we've spent what 50 billion dollars in gender studies in pakistan in our budget and uh Something I noticed last night was um, Maureen's dress. This may seem odd, but the the dress she no, was I wearing. No, I noticed too because I was like, "What?" <laughs> because it has a very, it has a, has a very uh, uh, uh you know, um, indistinct ethnic feel to it. Like it's there's an element of of classic Japanese or Chinese. Uh, style there um, when which is which is odd because when we see the party when we finally see Rand at the party they're doing what Karheen is described as which is Louis the Sun King mm -hmm. that is how the nobility is described and that's what you see in that party and that's what you see in oh, we'll leave that for a second Maureen's sister oh god anyway uh, yeah, yeah, I have thoughts on her too, but but, but, yeah, but so for then... whatever reason that they, they did so so one of the cool things that Jordan does is he takes um cultures and he mismashes them. So the Shinarans um are are built like the 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 German heavy cavalry of the late Middle Ages. That's 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 what they're described as, that's how they conduct their warfare and a little bit of their look as well. But they have a, a distinctly Zen samurai culture. So he's mismashing these things with, with the way, you know, with the way they look and the way they behave. You know, and he does similar things in, in other places as well. You could have done that with Alana if you weren't being racist. And there's no other way to describe it. Okay. Well, and, so and, you and again my case for Nynaeve. She was perfectly finely diverse before. Mm-hmm. But but no, you have to really focus in on this particular aspect of modern ethnicity, modern racial diversity. And if you were actually being diverse in principle, then you would say, hey, we have we have hired this, you know, diverse cast and we're going to, you know, m put them in where they fit best. We don't care about, you know, race, color etc and so forth except that you do because rather than you know putting alana in in uh in one of these mishmashed cultures of okay these people look indian but they dress in this traditional you know dutch garb or whatever you know but you didn't do that you make them all look like they're right out of a bollywood film mm -hmm. what is that but racism you you are you are stereotyping and prejudicing people who look like this yeah well despite the fact that you're in a fantasy world read some d'angelo and you'll see exactly what an actual racist looks like this is why she feels so bad and feels the need to write books and make other people feel bad because she is actually racist yeah uh All right. then, then we get to the second okay so then strong woman girl power saves her uh then we get to the second ring and i just i know they're combining characters in this scene and the actress that pulled it, that did it was actually okay. Mm -hmm. Well, why do we keep shitting on Matt's family? Mm -hmm. That should be Daisy Conger. And so now not only is Matt's mom the drunk, but she's also the witchy letting people die because she doesn't know how to do her job as the wisdom. 
why you're you're piling it on come on i know i was initially happy because hey tam I, tam's a great side character and this guy's a great character actor and was one of the few good things of season one. And Hey, we get more Tam. And then they go and they ruin it by crapping all over Matt and his family again. Yeah. So the, the, that played out exactly how you would expect the rings where it, she didn't want to leave, but she had to, well, I mean, relatively anticlimactic, but also accurate to, to the books. And then we get the last one, which they try to pull you, pull a fast one on you. I don't know if it got you or not. Um, it did briefly it, in hindsight, it shouldn't have, but it did because they're so dumb and, and I'll get to that in a second. But I, before we move on from that second ring though, I think it is interesting to again, hammer on the point that they've ruined the whole block idea with Nynaeve because there is a moment there where she's trying to, she, trying to, she knows she can do it. If she can just access the power, she can heal Tam and she can't, she can't embrace the power. So they're they're trying to play on the block. They're trying to play on what it does to Nynaeve on a personal level. This this struggle she has between wanting to be able to use the power but being afraid of and kind of detesting the power in Aes Sedai. But they've already kind of ruined the whole block thing anyway. They, again, mm -hmm. it's just scenes. There's no connective tissue. Well, there. And there was a little, little quick line from uh, Daisy Conger a la Matt's mom. Uh where she makes a comment that's reminiscent from season one that Nynaeve made that was ridiculous was it, her comment about no Aes Sedai coming to help because we're poor people, because we're the lower class. And where Nynaeve's thing in the first season was you wouldn't take in my mom because we were poor village kids. No, it wasn't even her mom. It was it was the wisdom that she apprenticed. Oh, under. yeah, the wisdom she apprenticed under. Yeah, because we're from the, the village. And it's like, no, you're 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 trying to make a, a class political statement here. You and, and then you completely it. ignore it because once you're done with that scene, you've moved on. And it's now new scenes. And if mm -hmm. if these new scenes happen to contradict something you've already said, well, it doesn't matter because the point's the point, not the not the actual art. Um and then we get to your ah uh, scene. Well, well, first I'll I'll tell you why the the fake out here kind of got me is because of all the band-aids. Because my first thought was, what the hell? How how do you, um, because when it first well, happens, when it first storms here's off. Here's why. I'm like, here's why it kind of got me. It was because like you, the band aids, but the way she came out of there, I thought they were going to have a flashback scene or something mm -hmm. after that. But well, well, but when, when she storms off, my first thought was, how the heck do you fix this? There's because you know, Nynaeve has to has to come back even if they're only very loosely basing this no, on you don't. the books rand, rand is fake dead and matt well, is in the tower and my so my my thought was oh no they're really doing this so, so what silly contrivance are you going to use to get her back into the tower i and, and i was thinking that that this would be what happens at the end of four that her storming off that that Egwene would follow her and Elaine would follow Egwene and this is how they're going to get her to to Tolman Head. It was when Land shows up out of nowhere, and and even then I was still going because they they uh, there's no there's no sense of geography. People just show up out of nowhere when they're needed. So even then it took me a second to realize, oh wait, no, this is this is this is too fortuitous even for them. But because there are the because there are so many band aids, because there are so many contrivances, it took me a second to be sure: is this actually? Are they doing what happened in the book and just taking it even farther? Because it, it took me a second there because of all the crap writing we've already seen so far. So then you're ah uh, scene, yeah. Oh. And i I referenced this, um. I referenced this last time of my my outburst of f these this effing story and the a holes who wrote it for a couple of reasons. Um, but even, but before we even get there, at, at the beginning of the scene, it's it's something that is very familiar to anyone who's read the books. But again, I want to know how this plays to someone who hasn't read the books. Is it even remotely clear what they're doing there? Because they don't have the callers, they're just grabbing girls and, and taking them away. 
and people are getting upset because oh you're you're taking my daughter you're taking my wife my sister whatever yeah but they, why they decided to use the pacifiers instead of the well okay and, and, even... and I, I can only think that it's it's a political correct move because if we put leashes on them it would imply slavery or whatever but i'm like they are slaves well even and with a pacifier a... they are slaves I don't know what the pacifier is supposed to be, but you've been to the um, Rotenberg Torture Museum, right? Mm -hmm. Tongue clamps were a thing back in the day. Sometimes they would clamp it to pull it out to cut it off. Sometimes they would just clamp it as a form of torture and to keep you from talking. So to me, the only way that silly golden pacifier works is if it's a tongue clamp as well, which is perhaps worse visually than seeing the caller but the point of the caller is that you are immediately in control you are immediately property you are immediately no longer a full human it is a much starker and obvious symbol of what's happening here we have no idea what's going on here if you haven't read the books um it, it also uh weakens the whole dominate idea because the reason they immediately clamp collars on these women when they go into these villages is because to them, these are dangerous animals. They mm -hmm. have to be leashed. Yeah. And if you're going to use the pacifier, you should have had them stuffing a pacifier in their mouth. Right. So, you know, something is up here and something it has to do. You, you would immediately tell you, oh, it's because they're like these other girls, which is what the whole point is. Exactly. And where was the soldam in that scene? is it's the Domine walking around with soldiers and she's pointing and the soldiers grab the girls. So it looks like the Domine is in charge. No, no, the Soldam should be in charge. And and again, it's not clear. You get a little bit at the end of the last episode when the Soldam are doing their silly, you know, uh, movements to direct the channeling. But even then, it's not entirely clear what the hell's going on there. Um, and and they make it worse in this scene by giving the Domine a degree of autonomy that she shouldn't have. Yeah. All and, right. And, and those of us that have been in the 80s with silly fantasy movies and stuff, you almost think that like they're a pairing of some kind, not in the way that is in the books where yeah. they develop an affinity for their slaves, but in a way that it's like, oh, you're born into this. And this is your this is what you do. You're you're twin sisters. You do this thing together yes and Ra it works better if you do it together than if you don't and rather than what it is in the books which is creepy as hell which is this is like a dog and her master that have just become so in sync yeah. that not only they, a dog and her master flow together a and dog work. who has been trained as as a, 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 a like a pit bull would be where they're going to do anything the master wants because they're the slave that's mm -hmm. that's why you can't just take any dog and have it pit fight because it'd just be like oh crap I I just want to be a dog and eat food and catch a frisbee yeah it's 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 a lot different yeah um so so even before we get there and then that giant platform that Suroth is sitting on just in the middle of this tiny little village in the middle of nowhere again just reinforcing the nonsense of why is this obviously very important person here in the middle of nowhere with only like 50 soldiers to protect her what this is nonsense okay and you you referenced something last time that i didn't want to go into detail on because i was going to rant about the death of uno here you i kind of liked uno in the first episode but you didn't because he was being too over the top he was being too uno and obviously here now at the beginning of episode three we see why because they were trying to cram all the uno-ness you get from the great hunt and the beginning of the dragon reborn all into just five to ten minutes of scream time because they were going to kill him off so that is part of my annoyance is not just did you kill off this beloved character from the books but you did it in a way that was cheap and contrived because again, the point of wheel of time was that Jeff Bezos declared he wanted his game of Thrones and the geniuses at prime video says, uh, we'll give you two because we'll, we'll get the license for part of Lord of the Rings and make rings of power. And that will be our family friendly game of Thrones because that's, that's the IP that is the more family friendly version. So we'll have more, 
you know, uh, will have tamer violence there like they did it like they did in Peter Jackson's movies. This Wheel of Time, this will be our real Game of Thrones, except they haven't had the guts to do it. I, I uh, uh, that was something I was going to mention with with the ring scene. You had a chance here to to do your your uh, 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 do the shock value that we're in the first couple of seasons of Game of Thrones that get everybody talking because in the books you go through these things naked. You're completely mm-hmm. naked, and they 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 didn't have the guts to do it because that would have been you know sexually objectifying a pretty woman. But now you have this scene which is very shocking due to its graphic nature. It's not quite as bad as the mountain uh, squishing what's his face his face, but it's it's on that level or it's close to that level because again, shock value they they have a scene that they are trying to elicit emotion, but instead it's just a turn off because it's so shocking because this is so out of character for most of the other violence that we have seen so far. It doesn't fit. Well, part of that is the fact that it didn't fit. It was very fake looking. And you also got to talk about the acting that's involved. Take that exact same scene in its context and how horrible of situation it was in American History X. And you got every bit of shock and you never saw his face flat. Where in this scene, you see every bit of his face flat. And you're just kind of like me. You're you're sh- you're shocked by the visceral. It's a visceral reaction. It is not a emotional or psychological reaction, which is what you want in a moment like that. It's what you the 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 end of season one, and they don't even show it after all the gore that they show after in season one of Game of Thrones, and they don't actually show like close up. You see it in the distance because uh, what's her face? Little girl Stark is covering, just turning away. Mm-hmm. So you you don't see it in the graphic detail they could have done and they did do in other instances because they weren't just trying to shock you on a visceral level. They had been setting this up the entire first season and now you're getting an emotional payoff. There was no payoff here because you had tried to cram books of unoness into five to ten minutes you didn't give the the you didn't give the audience a chance to connect with him you didn't show any connection there with perrin which is where you really would have had uh because he's supposed to be the surrogate for the audience is that if he has this connection with uno okay well now this is something shocking this is something you know that's really going to to motivate and drive parrot and the others you don't get that because there was no setup instead you just have this shock shocking scene for the sake of shock value Mm -hmm. that is why it pissed me off so much and yeah the only the only thing you can kind of add to it from a story standpoint is it it it, uh, inktar's can a little thing after that is like, dude, we got to live through this if we're going to do something good about it. Mm-hmm. And we we just we just saw that they're going to just kill anybody who doesn't swear. So you get a maybe a little bit of that, but that's even still it wasn't convincing. You didn't even get a sense yeah. of we're going to avenge him out of Ingtar there. Yeah, yeah. You just you just got a sense there. There was just kind of a, a there was a defeatism there. There wasn't a we live to fight another day. We're 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 going to get our revenge here later. So again, they're not even setting up. All right. So there's enough of that. And then we get to uh Logan and Rand. And this is where I kind of formulated that I think I, I was wrong about Logan being combined with Tame. Mm-hmm. Because we got a comment from I think it was Leandrin at one point. It, it was when Alana is talking to um Sherry him. I don't know why they're the ones talking about this, but but she's talking about the rise, the growing number of dragons, and the fact that false the uh, false dragons, and the fact that after years of decline, now all of a sudden we have three girls who all have the spark and are all incredibly powerful, including Nynaeve, who is the most powerful in centuries, possibly since the breaking. I, I don't know why they were the ones having this conversation, but anyway... 
Um, it was just to make Sherium relevant, but I guess yeah, we know semi- why Sawan's not in this season. Is uh, uh, <laughs> she's just away from the tower? That's what that's what the comment they made. But uh, so here's where I've kind of adjusted this because I think they are combining. Logan and Asmodian are combined. Yeah, that, and that becomes that becomes abundantly clear in the next episode when Moraine goes in to talk to him. Yeah, well, and also that Celine seems to also be trying to direct Rand to learn from Logan as well. Is helping him get in there to learn, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but again, there's a bandit. They're borrowing trouble here. Um, and it's it's either because they didn't understand it when they read it, because they're a bunch of morons, or they thought this would be cooler. Because remember... When Logan talks about seeing this person sitting on the top of a wall and he can't um he can't see who it is, he can't see distinction, but there's an aura about this person. This has nothing to do with the power. This is something else, perhaps a talent that the Logan talent for has. seeing Tavarin, probably. Yeah, yeah. Like 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 Loyal has a bit of that talent. This is something else entirely. So they either didn't get that. Or they wanted they they thought they needed to explain it better than Jordan himself did, which is that a a man who can channel can see another man who can channel because they have an aura about them. That's going to create a lot of problems later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, our 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 gripe about the end of season one, besides the fact that it was cheesy and contrived. You just borrowed a lot of problems for yourself that you're going to have to try and fix down the road. And the fixes are probably just going to create even more problems. I thought Celine was good here, the person playing that. Yeah. And then we get a scene. This is where we find out that Nynaeve actually doesn't come out of the rings. Mm-hmm. And the. Of course, we have Leandrin getting angry and everything, and I put a little note that she makes some of the bad scenes halfway decent, mm-hmm. uh, even though, like you pointed out earlier, which I didn't connect. For some reason, I glossed over it as we were going because uh, I thought she was doing good with pretty much every scene she did, but now she's angry that she didn't come out of the ring. Doesn't make sense if she's her enemy. Yep. But. But then Egwene crying after she finds out and doing all the, the, the whole sad scene, pushing Elaine away and everything. I'm a, I, I can be a crier during sad scenes in shows and movies. And this one had, didn't have me at all. I was just, it was me. It would have been a lot more impactful if there had been anything in Egwene's character prior to, to show this or at the, at the very least, it still would have been contrived that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she's trying to push Elaine away. Okay, but Elaine shouldn't leave. No, we're friends now, and you shouldn't be alone. Mm-hmm. Which is what she does do later, but they they don't have it here because they want this contrived moment. They just want this, you know, everyone is either yelling or crying. This is how they show emotion in this show. and And now it's yelling and then crying is what we have in this scene. And then Leandrin goes to see Matt again. And this is where he does the dumb eye thing that Perrin does all the time. So I think it's actually something they're being coached on. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not necessarily the actors himself, because he was like. I don't know. It just it throws me off. They just they become mouth breathers all of a sudden when they're not happy. But um Something I've been meaning to gripe about because we I'm skipping through. I'm looking at the scenes as they as we go along here. And after the nonsense, then you get Leandrin putting what would have been Nynaeve's ring back in the molten pool, this weird contrivance that they came up with for some bizarre reason. Um which I mean, I, I don't know. I guess it works on some level. What pisses me off about it is why are the rings like they're like Super Bowl rings? They're just ridiculously big and gaudy and silly looking. Mm-hmm. They are described as a very simple, almost like, it's it's like a wedding band, is how I have always envisioned it. It is a very simple 
band of gold that you have to actually look a little closer to realize it's a snake biting its own tail. It's supposed to be subtle. But they have no subtlety in this show because they don't have actual talent. You you can do subtle things if you have enough talent to be able to write and act nuance. And then to more, the writer's pissing me off about Matt. So not only did we get another moment of his family being the bad guy, Matt in the books, even early on, would have never left Egwene there. Mm -hmm. In fact, we get plenty of examples where he goes out of his way to protect her, like when he kneels to her in Saladar. Mm -hmm. And he does the thing he would never do for anyone else, but he sees one of his own is under attack. And so the mat that should have been in the tower at that moment never would have just slunk back into the in the darkness. Yeah. Um that pissed me off. I thought we were about to get Matt actual yeah, Matt. Yeah, here. The, the actual Matt. Yeah. Because Leanderin is Leanderin is telling him all this stuff, and all right, now get it, you know, I don't care about you anymore. He should have been, you know he should have immediately stepped up into hero map mode there, but you can't do that because the point is the point, not the art. And you can't have Matt coming to the rescue of these girl, these girl bosses, which again, Mr. Problematic Jordan actually did it well of essentially they end up rescuing each other. Mm -hmm. That, that, that is, that is something that happens routinely throughout, uh, throughout the whole the whole series is um you know take take for an instance since we're in Karheen here the fight in front of Karheen when Rand senses the lightning coming and he throws himself at the girls to grab Avienda and Egwene and try and shield them from the fall with his own body okay so he has his moment there <clears throat> because the girls are so you know not just because they're girls so they're physically smaller and weaker but They've they don't have the raw power he does, and they're worn out from channeling all day long. So he has his moment there where he has to rescue them. Later on, he has to be rescued because now he's overdone it and he's about to kill himself because he's been channeling so much, he's been doing so much, and they're at the end of the day when he just collapses and he has to be rescued. This it's it's a it is a recurring motif through Jordan's writing is you know, you know, sometimes you're the statue, sometimes you're the pigeon, and sometimes you're both. And you can go back and forth. Well, and one thing I, th that baffles me about the writing is you could have still done the feminization of men and had him just be like a crying shoulder there instead of actually trying to help her. Now, I have a little bit of a theory with the way Leandrin is handling Matt. I think this is an effort to get him to fall because we were about to find, you know, we're pretty sure the girls are going to end up there. Uh, well, and we, we, four. yeah. Well, you see that kind of at the end of episode four with what happens with men. Yeah. And, um, and, and if we're, yeah, if we're getting back to the books, if they're trying to, to salvage this somehow, you need men and Matt and all the girls in fall. They weren't together like yeah. Matt are, but you need them all there. All right, and then we also need Rand there. And then we have the the silly party uh, in Karheen. Uh, well, don't we have a naive scene first? Oh no, maybe I just didn't take any notes on the party. Uh oh oh no, uh, the I also forgot. Uh, before the it's not the naive scene; it's the Egwene and Leandrin, where she she actually channels against Leandrin <sighs> again because there's no connective tissue you don't feel it but Leandrin says what they want you to be feeling there which is that I thought you were the smart one because that was really dumb they're trying to show how emotional she is but they haven't earned it they haven't really set it up that Egwene is acting irrationally here because she's so torn up about losing Nynaeve. Um, 
I just kind of kind of like you, I felt nothing with that scene. Mm -mm. It's like, okay, I get what you're trying to do here, but this is just dumb and contrived. Well, and, then and you have the a novice channeling at an Aes Sedai and no repercussions other than a little little bitty smackdown in the moment. Yeah, there, there's this this threat of, oh, Jesus, is she about to kill me? She can't do that. But they haven't established it enough. There isn't enough of a threat there. And there isn't enough of a, a repercussion, you know, except for the mild, you know, girl boss stare down. And and then we get to the party in Karaheen, which kind of worked because they use they use this this older woman character uh, as an exposition dump to tell you to to clue Rand in on the things that in the book uh yeah, Almir, or sure, Al, is Al, Alvir, him. excuse me, who's Colavir, Almeida, uh, name your other Karheen nobles that were all and I'd combined really, into one name. And and because, so her name is uh, Anver. Anver, yeah. And so I didn't have the subtitles on when I was watching, and I didn't catch it, so I really thought that was Colavir. I thought that's what they said. And when you first see her, if you're a book reader, you have to assume that's Cola Bear mm -hmm. because of the way she's. But described. then when you see her, her name is it is a it's an like an amalgamation of all these noble yeah. Karian women that were plotting against Rand. Um. But that expedition jump doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't really do anything, except to okay, yeah. Rand is disgusted by how these people think and how they live, but he's also an a-hole. You've already established that he's not a good guy. Mm -hmm. Just beat the ever-living crap out of someone near to death because, basically. You know, he's not acting like a good guy, so you're, you're not being internally consistent, so... In, in this moment in the book, when Rand starts burning these notes, it works because you've already established who Rand is, and this is this is this reflexive, this this, this ref, reflexive disgust at, at the game of houses, especially when you have the foregate with the way it is and the way people live there, uh, and this you know this this harsh tiered class system in Karheen, you've already established that yes, of course this is going to disgust Rand. But now he's stuck in it and he has to try and live with it and manipulate it because he is stuck in this system. You have done nothing to set this up. And then so far, after the after the and I have to think, I have to think with the way episode four ends, he's not going back to Karheen, so this is going nowhere. This does nothing. Uh oh, and, and then after the party, he takes the wine to Logan, mm -hmm. and they have a little chat. And Logan is crazy, and Ran runs away because he's scared of the power. Yeah, it's basically how that sums up. And then we switch back to Matt, where he realizes, oh, the door is open. Oh, I can wander around. Um, and they just they just make it worse because he has that moment there where he's looking out in the courtyard on a Gwen, and you think he's actually going to do something about that, and then he just turns and leaves. Mm -hmm. Well, not only turns and leaves, goes back to his room. Yeah, I, I, I don't get it. And then we finish with Nynaeve in, in her vision again. Yeah, yep. And did you um, notice? You notice in that scene, when Matt dies in that scene, he lost an eye. I was like, oh, they're trying to throw these well, things in there so they can say we did. So that's how that's how the scene. So that's how the episode ends. Is is with uh Nynaeve finally figuring out the vision thing here but before we get there I thought you had there was something you wanted to talk about which is when 
uh, Ishamael has his little chat with Perrin. Oh, yeah. For some reason, my notes were out of order because I had Leandrin. Oh, is my theory of Leandrin that I had after that. Yeah. 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 So we talked about this off air and we both kind of had the same opinion. Ferris, Ferris, good acting. Yeah. Horrible scene. First of all, it didn't establish why he's a prisoner. Because the last time we saw him, he was swearing. Why is he a prisoner when he swore the oath? And why mm-hmm. is he separated from everyone else? Where's the rest of the Shine? Where are the Shinarns? Yeah, where is everybody else? Why is he a prisoner? And then, of course, Ishamayel appears, which can happen. You know, that's if you know the lore, uh, you would have saw, seen a flash of light and he would have been taking a risk in a moving vehicle of cutting Perrin in half. But uh, it's uh, it's possible. The line, the more wolf you are, the more you're mine. Yes. The whole point of the wolf was that it was counter to the actual evil of the Dark One. Yep. And and this this can work if later on it is established that he's lying because he's a corrupter Mm -hmm. i I believe that's one of his nicknames isn't it um Uh, they call him father of lies at some point betrayer um, of hope betrayer of of hope yeah Yeah, that was one of them betrayer of hope uh so it can work if it's established that he's lying he knows he's lying and he's just trying to corrupt and scare perrin um but They've done nothing to set this up except the Hulk smash scene where he kills his wife at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And then they've they've kind of referenced it. But be, because these people aren't especially talented and because the point is the point, not the art, they don't know how to layer that. They don't know how to play that except to just reference it. You don't actually see any. So as an example... I have uh I have talked personally to and then heard you know on 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 interviews and people talking numerous uh veterans say that uh American sniper is the best portrayal of PTSD that they've ever seen in media because that, that media invariably always gets it wrong except there well you you in, in that you had a really good director in clean eastwood you had a really good actor in bradley cooper and you had two people that actually ex- respected the source material which was the real life autobiography of uh of chris kyle and so it, they they were dedicated to portraying it properly and and the, the scene in particular that i've heard people point out is when um he's in a he's in an auto shop and someone's talking to him and he's kind of like there are these noises and things in the periphery and he's he's holding it together like outside having this conversation. But you can see through his eyes, through the way Cooper is acting, he's kind of starting to lose it. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's there's subtlety there. They're 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 building something there. They don't build anything here. You just see you just ha- he just mentions it and he has his his outburst when they have their silly uh, teen drama moment at the end of episode or the end of season one, uh, when all the two rivers people are yelling at each other, but there's nothing of substance ever established. So this, this falls incredibly flat. And I, and I think, I think it's made worse by episode four because when, when, when he's with Elias and the wolves, there's no hesitation there. There's no trepidation there. He just, he's just taking all this in the, the only, the only moment where it seems like he's unnerved is the fact that Elias is eating raw meat for some stupid reason. Well, not only that, it it goes back to still episode three, Elias, when he breaks open the door to save him, he's got blood running down from his mouth. And I'm like, he's long tooth. He should have a he should have a freaking uh, 
I almost said David Bowie. Uh, what what's the guy? Bowie knife. <laughs> Bowie yeah. knife. Was, uh, crocodile Dundee. Uh, the crocodile yeah. Dundee knife. He is what he should have. And, exactly. But he he's biting these guys in the neck as a human, which is not the best fighting style, by the way. Yep. Uh, and, and and is again they 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 want that moment there of Elias the Wolf Man, but it's stupid in, on its face. But then again, in episode four. When when Perrin has that moment where where Elias tells him is starting to tell him what's going on, basically, and he he kind of freaks out looking down at the wolf beside him going, is this a wolf brother? Is this what I'm going to turn into? And Elias says, don't be stupid, boy. What, what do you mean? Don't be stupid. You're running around biting people's throats out. <laughs> what's he supposed to think? What are we the audience supposed to think? I mean. Especially, especially an audience that hasn't read the book but knows modern media, you you would expect that a normie is going to think, "Oh, these are werewolves," because that kind of is what they set up. Mm -hmm. Well, you needed a little more, bit, bit more trans activist language there. You are what you feel like you are inside. That's a good point. Yeah. All right, but but before we get too too much further into episode four. I, I, we do need to end on the ending of episode three here, which is Elaine goes down into the basements where they're not supposed to be, and Egwene is trying to activate the ring. And Elaine tells her that it takes Link's sisters to do this. You're going to hurt yourself. I fully expected that she was going to do it anyway. And and when she did it, I was mildly and pleasantly surprised. Of, oh, okay. They're not just going to have her girl boss it and save the day. Um, so I liked the moment, but again, it's all in a vacuum. It's all disconnected scenes. It doesn't make any sense that yet from what little they've shown of Elaine, they actually did a decent job of setting up her character. So it's fully in keeping with her character that I'll go get us some blankets and I'll sit with you and we'll wait here together. But why is Egwene accepting that now when she just shrieked and pushed her away earlier? They haven't done anything to set up for Egwene that, and there's no moment of, I'm sorry for yelling at you earlier. She's still bitchy. Mm -hmm. So they, they, want, they want the touching moment, but they don't know how to set it up. And so it's crap. Um, and something that genuinely surprised me here at the end of this um when Nynaeve comes out and my wife noticed this too and she's like half normie so that's why I was wanting to watch it with her her comment was but she didn't do anything and I, I, I have to wonder how many other normie type people who are bothering to watch this noticed that is it just happened the doorway was just there which was a real head scratcher to me because you have a genuine girl boss moment in the books when Nynaeve realizes that she's missed the doorway, realizes this isn't real. It's not that she has to run for the door because she's being chased by Trollocs, which again, I think weakens Nynaeve as a character. It's not that she has to run for the doorway. She recognizes this isn't real. I need the doorway, but I've let it go. She jams a thorn into her palm to make her mad enough to be able to channel. And then she forces it open. She's not supposed to do any of that. She's not supposed to be able to do any of that. You're not supposed to be able to channel when you're inside the rings at all. And you're she not does. even supposed to be able to know you're inside. You're the not rings. supposed to remember that yeah. you can. You're not supposed to remember it's even a thing. And she does. So not only does she do that. But then she has so much raw power, she can force this Terra Angreal back open. They had it in the books for them. They're either too dumb to realize how important that was, or they didn't actually read the books. Whoever wrote this episode or whoever edited this episode, because it just happens. And, and even and yeah, and even still, you could have incorporated Egwene trying to force it open. And it not working with that because it could have started flickering. That's a good point. You get a little flicker there. And yeah, it could have been flickering there. Jogs then... Nynaeve's memory and she's like, oh, crap, this isn't real. Yeah. And then she could have taken that flickering image and held it solid by channeling. 
but she just she doesn't do anything. Well, and she doesn't even have that it's not real moment. She still grabs her daughter and tries to take her through running from the Trollocs. Which this is kind of a failure is, of the test. Yeah, this door is our escape, is what she was doing in that moment. Which which is kind of a failure of the test, because the point is you're you're supposed to leave these things behind. And and basically this is this is you proving this is you proving a verbal pledge to the tower that I'm basically forsaking everything else for the tower. And that's what she does in the books that there's, there's Lan and two children. And, you know, it's even more idyllic in the books because she's an actual freaking queen and they're in, uh, here. They're in Malkir, a reclaimed Malkir. Uh, and so it, it's even harsher in the books, but it's also more of a girl boss moment. And the fact that they didn't just to me, this scene perfectly illustrates how and why the writing is so bad, especially compared to the books, because they had a great moment written for them and they either didn't know or didn't know how to pull it off. But this one was more action. This yeah. one was showing Uno getting his face stabbed in instead of giving it the actual emotion behind some, with the moment that should have been. All right, so then we get on to, to episode four, which was interesting to me, sort of. Well, you said boring. What I got out of it was all the Band-Aids we needed were being put in there to kind of get us to the next moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I meant specifically the the very opening of the episode, which is Ishamel walking through this strange kind of mm. narrow pillars of things. And and when 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 he looks up and the camera pans up, you get this hint. I kind of like this. You get this hint that these are like ancient skyscrapers he's walking under. Mm. Because you can see there's some kind of structure. Um this isn't just like a, a, a rock spire that wait there's some kind of facade there are those windows are these buildings and they you kind of get the sense that these are like skyscrapers from the age of legends so yeah, and what i also got the sense of this was supposed to be shao ghoul because the, the it, you know how it kind of tightens around you and it gets more imposing as uh, you walk i hadn't through. thought of that so you could you could also say because the bore was drilled right in the middle of this major city mm -hmm. in the actual That's books the so these could have been the skyscrapers that were the imposing metal city that we don't have anymore. So, and then he does some funky channeling and then there's a woman covered in blood there. Yeah, which he says is Lanfear in that scene. Uh, and y you also see that he breaks a seal to do it. And I am not upset with them using that, the breaking of the seals to release the other Forsaken because it was kind of, it is kind of in line with what it was. The seals were weakening and they were breaking on their own as these things were happening. Whereas having having uh, Ishamayel be the one to actively do it, that's that that's fine by me. And I, I think that actually plays better to the screen than trying to portray the uh, the, this, the more metaphysical slowly, yeah, the prison more, that's in the yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure how I felt about that. I, I can see how. It would it would make certain things more cinematic if you had the Forsaken in different prisons bound by the specific seals rather than all in the boar, all in one place like they were. It also makes his the the breaking of the seal when you first have him come out m make more sense. Yeah, true. Because because you know Ma Maureen's comment is I don't think we killed the Dark One. I think we released one of his generals. Mm -hmm. basically he tr a, a vision of him tricked ran into breaking the seal for him and now he's going around <laughs> breaking out all these other prisoners all right so then it switches to it and you said you had thoughts on this so i imagine this is where you're going to put them in so then the that that's the that's the prologue after the credits the first scene is this on lady from the party and uh, her sister is at the door and in walks Moraine. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is why I was kind of ranting about the dress, but this is one of the reasons is why she comes in and she says she wants to keep a low profile. Then why are you dressed like that? You stick out like a sore thumb. Well, and why is her dress so much different than her sister's then? Exactly. So you're in this kind of Asian inspired thing and she's dressing like, you know, the, the height of, of French aristocracy in the late Middle Ages, which is what Jordan clearly described and said flat out, that's what this is. So why are you dressed so different when you're trying to keep a low profile? It just is silly. It Not only is it silly, but it makes Moraine look dumb. Yeah. So, so, okay, in, so this, in, this is my note okay. about Moraine in this entire episode, but I really got it in this first scene. Moraine in this show embodies all of our complaints about Aes Sedai arrogance and hubris. That's a good point, which is a, a much better way of saying what I was going to say, which is this short scene um, shows us that Moraine is a moron and a bitch. Because it's bad enough what she's doing to Lan, who is, you know, we're going to have a scene later where Lan is talking about he's upset that... Uh, you know, she said we were never equals, and Yvonne says, "Well, of course we're not. We're not supposed to be." So you you do get that kind of backhanded explanation for why she's being a bitch to land. This is your own sister, who you have not seen in decades. You could at least fake cordiality just on simple politeness. Mm -hmm. Well, which, which is funny because we talk about the modern writing of women. This is the girl boss, Moiraine. But the thing that makes her that that they they think in the show is making her girl boss was the ultimate weakness of the Aes Sedai in the books. Yeah. They're they're they're. I mean, I hadn't really thought of it in these terms before. That, huh? This is something of an epiphany. The Aes Sedai have the same problem the Ashaman have, and they don't realize it. But it's not as severe as the Ashaman because they aren't affected by the madness. But there's a reason why Kadsuin is the one that has to teach Rand and the Ashaman laughter and tears. Because Kadsuin gets it, I think. Mm -hmm. I think it's strongly implied that she gets that this is the problem with the Aes Sedai. This is why I've stayed away from the tower so long because we're not human anymore. We have separated ourselves from rather than being the servants of all, as Aes Sedai used to mean, we are separate from and rulers over people and we are losing our humanity. And so I think that's kind of why she has to be the one to teach them because she has recognized it. It's, it's, it's the old... You know, it's, it's the biblical scripture of remove the speck from your own eye before you complain about the plank in your brother's eye. She has she has seen it. She has recognized this fault in me and my people, and I've taken steps to try and remove myself from it and correct it. So that's why I can recognize it in Rand and the Ashaman and why I know we need to do something about it. Yeah. Well, and spoilers for the books, if you if you you're still reading them or whatever, but she also brings a motherly quality. Yes. And not the overbearing mother, not the Freudian <laughs> sense of motherly. It's it she is actually nurturing motherly. And what we get with Rand in the books is it takes her, but then it also takes Tam. Mm. So you needed he, he needed he needed mommy that he never had when he was growing up. What but and, also and, he needed still daddy. And pulling it back to this scene here. And and one of the reasons my brain went on that tangent is because one of the reasons Cadswin is able to eventually be successful, she does reach him, is Moraine is the one who lays the groundwork in Fires of Heaven when she tells Egwene, when Egwene thinks you're letting him walk all over and she, and she says basically, no, I just remembered how you embrace Sidar. You surrender to it. And it shows she basically initiates that role by by stopping this this overbearing um ruler that she was being and being 
starting to be more of a mentor. Which... Maybe, maybe they're trying to set that up by having her so over the top right now that she has that epiphany moment and yeah, they don't trust the audience to get something subtle. So they're just doing it over the top. But well, we'll we'll see if they actually do it because where where the episode ends, there's there's no emotional epiphany there. She's basically blackmailed into being civil. This is my city. I know everything that's going on. I know I even know what you're up to to a degree because all of your eyes and ears are actually my eyes and ears. So if if you want what you're after, you're going to sit down and you're going to have tea with me. And she acquiesces, not because she was shamed into actually acting like a human being, but because she was blackmailed. Mm -hmm. Uh, All right. Next note. Next note, we've got Celine. I think personally, I think it's the only actress that read the source material because she she actually comes across like you get Celine. Like you could tell there's more to her, but at the same time, she's act she's still acting the part of I just want to be your lover, but I love powerful men. Please be strong for me. Please be the go-getter I want. Mm -hmm. And then you get that scene where he channels and she initially is like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. But then comes back and is like, if you want, if you want something, you have to take it. Mm -hmm. You 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 don't scare me. I trust you. And that, that was that, that was, was probably the best scene off. in the whole series so far. Yeah, it was. It was. <clears throat> Uh, so I well, think, it, but, she, but she's embodying that now. What how she does as Landfear, we'll see. But to to your point, I don't think they do a great job in the scenes setting up that moment here at the end of this episode. But she does a great job in the subtext of those scenes because this is one of the few moments where you ha actually have a setup and payoff. And I think it's completely on accident. I don't think it's the writing and the direction. I think it's her ability, the actress's ability to to insert that subtext. And that's why I think you may be right that she's one of the few who's probably, I think Elaine has read the source material. I think she's doing a pretty good Elaine. And I don't, from what, from what we've seen elsewhere, I don't trust her to get that direction without having got, gotten there herself, basically. Uh in that scene, I thought Rand actually did well too. It wasn't just her. I think he. I think yes. that was his best scene of the whole series. And I, I think it helps if you've got good chemistry with the person you're working with too. So hopefully, we see more of that going forward. Which actually, yeah. the the my at the 59 minute mark, it it all got ruined. Involves those two as well. But we'll we'll get to that here in a second. Which we actually got to kind of accelerate. I got a client in 20 minutes. Oh, I thought we, I thought you were, I thought we were out at four. Okay, no, we're at at three. We're at at three today. All right, I have um, class at four, but I have a client at three. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. okay, so this is another good Leandrin scene where I think I think her her pivoting to get Nynaeve to go to Falm was pretty good with what they were doing with that scene. Mm -hmm. where she was you know they, they actually were talking about her son and how you give up everything for the tower mm -hmm. and then she pivots right to to foam and it didn't feel contrived it was it, it, it was it, it almost we're, we're, we're having a bonding moment here so i'm going to confide in you mm -hmm. yeah it worked uh another note that i'm still not happy with pike as moraine even so you're talking about her dress i said even the way she walks sucks is what i said it was a little bit odd yeah um uh, min as a pseudo dark friend does not do it for me the yeah so i get what they're doing there and i think they did a decent job of establishing okay we're, we want to cast suspicion on her, but they've also given given enough of an out that she's not actually a dark friend because she's shocked at who is this person and he's really creeping me out. And I don't care who you are and how powerful you are. I'm not going to help you hurt people. Mm -hmm. so she does try and stand up for herself, even knowing she's. The, 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 the big problem with that scene is that is actually going all the way back to the, the beginning of the series when Moraine just walks in and says, I'm an Aes Sedai and I'm one of yours, the dragon. 
you've just besides the fact that you've just pissed all over the source material you've ruined you've ruined the moment within your own work because you have just cheapened what that means there should have been a much stronger reaction from men when mm -hmm. he said forsaken when he started going through his the lists of names which not not everyone's going to know betrayer of hope and these other these other titles that Ishmael has but when she said forsaken she should have literally been falling out of her chair trying to get away mm -hmm. there should have been a much stronger reaction there uh, but to your point I, I think that that scene is setting up there that is their contrived way of getting Matt and Min to Toman Head for for the finale of the Great Hunt. Mm -hmm. Um it's just obnoxiously contrived. And it's it was a very dull scene to me. Especially especially considering the chemistry they had earlier when they were when they were trying to break you know break into each other's rooms. There were some there were some nice scenes there when they're scraping away at the mortar trying to move the move the stones and they're having that conversation there. As as contrived as it was, because as you said, they don't have that moment in the books. They played it well with each other. They had good chemistry, and this scene is just boring. Uh, all, same with all the the land with with Alana scenes. They're just silly mm -hmm. and boring to me. Um. So I assume we should hurry up and get to the end. Yeah, and I guess I got ahead of myself with with uh, Celine and Rand because I have a note here that says cheap special effects kind of ruin a good scene. Uh, and this is where Celine and Rand have their moment where he channels where he where he fries the murder all. Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that looked a little cheap. So that yeah, cheap, cheap special actually. effects there, but they I think the scene in itself was good. You know, they they got too much money to have that cheap of special effects, but. So, so what was the scene and, from earlier? And, and again, she plays it well of initially being scared because this is, she's supposed to be, she's supposed to be a normal woman in this world. And in this world, men who can channel are terrifying. Mm -hmm. they, they are, they are boogeyman stories told at night, but she also continues the, the turn works because she's already been laying that subtext in their scenes of she's trying to seduce him more than just sexually. So it, it, it works there because she, the actress set it up. I give no credit to the writing and direction uh, that I, I give all the credit to the, the actress there. Um, I and just then, wish. Then they go to do the hanky panky and she well, reveals who she is and. Before we get there, um, I don't know why they had to make Lan a moron to set this up, though. Hmm. Of 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 Yvonne and Alana sneaking in and getting that. Uh, I guess that's the thing that that Doman brought to, um, to Moraine, and it's it, it's from the writing on the wall in the in in the in the book, and so so it's 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 a prophecy. It's it's poetry. It's, it's dark prophecy. prophecy. Yeah, it's a dark prophecy. Um. Lance should absolutely know who the daughter of the night is, especially since he's he knows that what they've what he and Maureen have been working for for the past twenty years is about the dragon, mm -hmm. and and Lanfear, the daughter of the night, is prominently connected to the dragon in history and prophecy. So I just I I, I wish don't I wish they could have found a way to do this without making Land look dumb. But again, this is the talent they have. Or lack thereof. This is what they do. Well, and also incompetent. Lan, the the character yes. Lan, never would have had. No one would have ever been able to sneak into his rooms and grab something out of his saddlebag. And all right, so now, and had it very, in a way that they would even know what to look for. The yeah yeah. Why is he there in the first place? What what prompted this? Mm -hmm. I mean, I uh, whatever. Let's we got to hurry up. So I, let's get to the end of the scene because. Even with the, because you said that Lanford reveals who she is. She doesn't really, she just, something's going on here. You know, something more than what was being said up previously. She is much more than she seems. And you get the sense that, is she starting to channel? What's going on here? And then, oh, 
deus ex feminist saves the day uh, uh yeah that's right <laughs> slices but, her throat <laughs> but but even with the creepiness and rand quasi freaking out of celine what's going on here it was still very contrived to me that in the end he doesn't just break moraine's neck well not only that this is the part that got me it that scene, okay, Moraine is doing the C- series Moraine thing, and she's all knowing and all good at everything, and comes in, saves the day, and Rand just goes with her. But even for the Forsaken in the books, that would have killed Landfear. They were still human. They were just very powerful humans, and they knew how to protect themselves. Actually being stabbed and her throat slit would have killed Lanfear. Yep. So apparently they're they're taking the immortality of the Forsaken more literally. And they're it would seem they're just going to ignore the body swapping thing that the Dark One does, is what it looks like to me. Well, but not only that, if it's if this is a power that comes with the power they have, Rand would have it. While Rain would have it. And I need would have it. Well, that's what I'm saying is I think what they're saying here is this is this this comes from their connection to the dark one. Unless what they're setting up is that this is something particularly special about land fear. Because there was a there the 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 dialogue's a little odd there, but the with what Moraine is saying, there was a it, I had this thought of is she saying that land fear in particular has this special immortality somehow she can't be killed but even even before that rand is is fully bought into this woman he is fully wrapped around her finger as evidenced by that scene we just had that celine celine just you know you know, brought, you know, brought it home there that the 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 days or weeks or have months or however long they've been shacking up together. All of this setup is finally paying off here in this moment. And now I've got you in your mind because I I just found out you can channel uh, and I'm scared. But no, I still love you and I'm going to support you and I want you to be you don't hide parts of you from me. But now all of a sudden. Moraine shows up out of nowhere after we some amount of months, you know, we, we get the vague sense a lot of time has passed. So Moraine shows up out of nowhere, kills this woman you've been shacking up with and seem to have a fair amount of affection for. She tells you it's Lanfear and that's good enough for you to run away into the night with her. So on top of say, so the girl boss moment didn't bother me nearly as much. One As because the lack we, of boy boss. Yes. One because we've seen it. Two, we've seen it in this season with her killing the freaking Murdral with a dagger. So she's already girl bossed her way out of a, a situation. And but so I I wasn't that shocked or surprised by it. What annoyed me well, more was the and Rand just goes. Well, because even if you take Rand from the books. He has Lanfear's name in his list of females that he that he takes credit for for dying. Yep. yep. So, so we're not getting Rand's biggest weakness is not even present in this series because his biggest weakness is sh- sh- chauvinism. <laughs> patriarchy. It's the patriarchy. Yeah. yeah. Well, fate decided it because he's the dragon. You, there were some decent moments in here. If I can like step outside of myself and look at myself watching this, I, I agree with you that this was probably the best episode in the whole series so far because there were some genuine moments. But as I've been hopefully making the point, the point I've been trying to make is all of those moments fall flat because they either have no setup or they have contradictory setup. Well, like but Perrin that, with Elias. That's why I liked it, because I think they're trying to bring it back home, mm. and they they just put themselves in such a bad situation that. But you could see that it's moving. Episode four, you could see that a lot of things are moving back to the right direction. Story wise, not necessarily in 
production value or mm-hmm. acting or any of that, but th- they're actually trying to get you where everything needs to be by the end of the second book. Yes, it does look like they're moving in that direction. And so I am actually for the first time looking forward. I, I, I you know, say that with a heavy amount of air quotes. I am actually looking forward to episode five out of just morbid curiosity of, okay, where do you go from here? Are they going to continue where they left off with episode four? Or are we going to get more of the same, more of what we saw in episode one, two, and three, and all of the first season, which is just scenes that aren't really connected, that don't really flow and build off of each other. So I, I am curious to see where things go next to see how how right you you may or may not be. We well, <laughs> me being right can still be bad with, well, where, with where we, you know, yeah, we're going in the right direction, but we may have already be- taken a left at Albuquerque a long time ago. So, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, even if, even if they like pull off an exact replica of the finale of, of, uh, the great hunt again, I feel like it's going to fall flat and I'm going to be bored because they they've ruined it all with everything they've set up thus far Mm -hmm. well and realistically the only thing they haven't really set up is rand going to fall yeah while rain just saved him from land fear but we've still got no information of to why you need to go three four months west that way Yeah. yeah Yeah, I'm wondering if they're going to bring Varen back into it because they did Varen and Moraine did have that moment there. So I'm wondering if they're going to do what the what what the 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 device is in the book is Varen knowing the prophecy as well as having some inside information and knowing that Rand needs to be here. Rand needs to get to Tolman Head. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm wondering if if Varen is going to show up to help Moraine and somehow convince her that that they need to go that way. Or if Moraine is already the girl boss who has figured it out and knows that Rand has to go to Tomin Head because she is awesome. Yeah, because she was doing the research, you know, in her lovely dress, which somehow led her to this small little cabin that nobody has any connection to because Landfear doesn't have any. She says my family or whatever going out here, but she actually doesn't because we just found out that she was just now brought out of the seal. So mm-hmm. there's not going to be any records of it where anywhere that while rain was looking yeah. this this is that that scene it was so contrived in so many ways because there's no absolutely no way while rain would have even known where he was well and the not intimation, even the eyes and ears not any exactly. not even the eyes and ears the, would have had that the the inference you're supposed to make is somehow her sister pointed her in the right direction how the hell would she know mm-hmm. because as far as she knows she's just playing the traditional game of Karheen and politics and and she wants to get rid of Moraine so that Moraine doesn't screw up all the work she's done to reclaim their family name. Um, yeah, but you talk to the guard at the gate. Okay, he went that way. That way was east. East from one of the largest cities in the whole yeah. world at this point. Yeah. 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 Well, it's a lot of nonsense, but we'll we'll keep up with the nonsense so you can have some cathartic release with us or, you know, not watch it at all, but still satisfy the morbid curiosity of what's going on with it. All right. Well, that's it for today. And no winner's heart this week because I'll be out of the country and we'll pick everything up when we come back. Maybe we'll do winner's heart first thing when we, when I get back. So that's at yeah. least only a week and a half gone. All right. Well, we'll see y'all then. Later.